and we'll look forward to seeing uh, Kyle Joliff uh, now. We know him from several presentations he's given before, and uh, uh, he lives in Toronto, Canada. He's been to the Wichita show twice. <clears throat> we loved having him here. And uh, Kyle, I, I won't go on and on about you, but you're a great fella and look forward to seeing your presentation and thank the Toronto Club for letting us have this sneak preview. Take it away, Kyle. Good, thanks very much, Hal. I wanna add that a number of the postcards in the presentation were purchased um, this year at the Wichita Postcard Club and then eight years ago, my the other time I went to the Wichita Postcard Club. Could, um, I'm interested in um, Chinese culture and history. My grandparents were missionaries there. I'm also interested in New York City postcards. So today's presentation is an outgrowth of both of those interests. It's about um, Chinese restaurants in the United States and Canada. It covers the period about 1900 to late 1960s. It's a period of cultural homogenization. By that, I mean it's a, a lessening of diversity. The two cultures grow together and uh, mutually beneficial. The first, the first slide is of the Shanghai Lo Cafe in San Francisco, California, and um, it opened in 1913. So I show this to illustrate how um, postcards reflect the basic facts of a, a restaurant business. To have a successful restaurant, you have to have the right location. You have to good have to have good food. You have to have a, a good decor. So. Um, this picture also tells us more than that. It, it shows that the, this particular family, the Lowe family in, in uh, San Francisco had um, assimilated to, to some degree to Western culture. They're all wearing Western dress. It's also perhaps a picture from the opening of the restaurant. There's some flowers, which to me, you know, marks a, a opening of a business. Um, but he, so here we get, uh, we see the, the inside, um, decor. And here on this postcard from late 1920s, we see the um, the location. And also we know um, something about the food. There, there's a sign, uh, this part of the, the, the lantern at the edge of the left-hand edge of the overhead sign. It's, it says noodles and chop suey. And those were the, the big two calling cards for Chinese restaurants, you know, from the early 1900s through to I think about the 1940s. Um, so this was a family business and of course, um, restaurants need to be renovated over time. This is a nice 1939 card by the Kurt Tyke company um, showing renovations based on um, work by uh, Chinese craftsmen. So the family was also involved in a nightclub across the street. And this is actually quite a famous nightclub. You can look on the internet and find out much more about it, many interesting stories about the, the floor show they had with Chinese dancers and, and so on. Um, there's a whole culture of floor shows and, and, and dancing that, that's, that's really quite interesting. So the first Chinese restaurant is open in San Francisco about 1850. And the form of those restaurants evolves and, and sort of by 1900, it's kind of established there's um, circular tables with four or five chairs, chairs or, or stools per table. There's ornate um, woodwork. There's um, lacquer work. There's murals on the walls sometimes. And, and uh, this is uh, repeated across the country as we'll see. Uh, this is the Port Arthur Chinese restaurant in Washington, DC. And we see those same features uh, but a slightly different setting. This is uh, an older church that, that became a Chinese restaurant uh, from about 1905 to the 1930s. So again, you see that the, the circular tables, uh, probably with inlaid pearl, it, it's teak wood, um, and um, a lot of very nice screen work. Um, we also see the cashier's area on, on the right. And this is the Mandarin restaurant in Minneapolis. Again, uh, similar style um, tables and uh, chairs, also the, um, the decor on the walls of uh, murals. Uh, also to the left, um, you can also see the same kind of um, ornate woodwork. 
So this is the, the Port Arthur restaurant in New York City, uh, quite famous actually. Port Arthur um, is a city in, in um, Northeastern China, a scene of a famous naval battle between the Russians and the Japanese where the, the Japanese def defeated the Russians decisively. This is the, um, the main dining room. And um, there's a message on the card about um, the, the tables, you know, being quite nice with um, inlaid pearl and, and uh, they enjoyed the meal and the fruit was delicious. In the background, we can see some people, probably um, the managers or the owners of the restaurant. Um, so this restaurant had a number of um, side rooms as well. It's on the second floor. And a lot of um, tourists would come and eat here. This is the kitchen of the Port Arthur restaurant, um, a rare card. So the, wanted, the restaurant owners you know, wanted to project an image of um, cleanliness and order. And I think that this does it quite well. Um, kitchen, kitchen scenes on, on restaurant postcards are actually quite scarce. And of course, uh, Chinese restaurants didn't just serve tourists, they served the um, Chinese community itself with its need for things like wedding banquets and celebrating the uh, Chinese Lun Lunar New Year. I suspect that, that, that these children are in fact celebrating the Chinese Lunar New Year. Uh, quite a lovely scarce card. Uh, of course, there was um, some distaste among some people about Chinese restaurants. Um, there's real racism against the Chinese community from the 1850s onward. Um, so uh, uh, the card on the left um, actually talks about how um, the person who sent the card, you know, went to a went to a chop suey restaurant in Chinatown and describes it as a tough hole, and that the food he got there was worse than the the place in Buffalo that. I guess the person he, he, that he and the person who received the card also went to. Um, so on the right is um, a picture of a real photo postcard of one of the uh, premier restaurants in, in, in Chinatown in New York City, which was called the Chinese Tuxedo. So this is the back of a, a tuck postcard for the, for the uh, Tuxedo restaurant. Again, it, here's this um, example of um, the distaste or, or bias against Chinatown, seeing them as unsafe places. And this was mailed to um, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Dear mother, went through Chinatown last night. It is an awful sight. This restaurant is where Elsie Siegel was murdered, Grace. Well, Elsie Siegel was, the, was um, a missionary to Chinatown. She actually had uh, two Chinese lovers and she was uh, murdered in a sensational case. Uh, they never caught the man they suspected of murdering her. But um, the murder um, seems to have taken place at a different Chinese restaurant, not this one, but it's a, it's a symbol of the um, discrimination that, that existed that can be seen on other postcards um, and trade cards uh, from this earlier, from this era and also in the, the 1880s. Um, next slide. But, um, the Chinatowns for a new generation were, were exotic, you know, so people, some people called them slummers, you know, would, were happy to go and visit the Chinatowns. And here's a bus that would, well, at least the 1906 version of a bus that would take people from uh, the New York theater on Broadway and 44th street to Chinatown. And, and if you look on the, the far left, you'll see, um, you'll see the advertisement. Uh, we're going to Chinatown coach tonight at 830 or 1130. So, so Chinatown became a, a popular place for um, tourist excursions, something exotic and, and a, a little risque because there were uh, things like gambling dens and there were temples and there were um, also opium dens. Um, but it was a way also of introducing Chinese food to, to many people in America. And part of that process of, of homogenization that I'm talking about, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, a cuisine homogenization, you know, as well as a, a cultural homogenization. So here's a picture about 1915 of Chinatown by night. This is uh, what the tourists came to came to see. Uh, so 
uh, they were also interested in the curio shops um, that would be open at night as well. And, and one of the main ones was the Soy He Company. And um, I, I like this is part of, seems to be part of the same um, series or it's the same publisher as the the earlier pictures I showed you, the Port Arthur restaurant, the main dining room and the and the kitchen. Um, and you'll you can see that the port you see the sign for the Port Arthur on the second floor uh, of the building. And this is uh, what people would see inside. You know, it, it's Chinese ceramics, and this is the tea and coffee uh, department where people could buy um, delicious Chinese tea, such as jasmine or or puar tea. And and we see the store workers here. Um, I mean, this is. Um, this is something that people would find um, exotic and interesting. And there was also a, a, an imitator of this kind of thing on, on Broadway called Van Teens. And you can, I also have postcards Van, of, from Van Teens of their or, oriental department with ceramics and whatnot. And this is the uh, silk and embroidery department at the Soy Key department. So, you know, a visit to Chinatown really could be, could be quite exotic. Um, so, um, but by 1910, chop suey and Chinese food had a, a wide acceptance in America and, and chop suey was really America's fast food. So there's many, um, many Chinese restaurants um, across the country in, in the larger cities that um, em embrace the, embrace chop suey as something they're serving and, and embrace all these tourists who are interested or slummers who are interested in coming and seeing the coming and having a meal there and, and um, experiencing that having a real um, I guess today we call it a cross-cultural experience and there's also music in the restaurant um, develops um, you can see the the heading at the the top right hand corner fine orchestra um, and this is this particular restaurant is in downtown Chicago uh, another Chicago restaurant, um, mailed about 1911, um, the Mandarin restaurant, and uh, has quite fancy decor, as you can see on the uh, uh, the left and the right, and, and the same type of um, circular tables, probably um, inlaid. So, um, you know, this is a, a fancy, perhaps after theater crowd um, who've come there, uh, you know, it's an advertised as the most beautiful and world famous Mandarin restaurant select American and Chinese bill of fare. And the same pattern is, is uh, repeated in Detroit, for example, the Chinese Pavilion Cafe with signs for um, chop suey, um, uh, quite prominent on, on each side of, of the restaurant. This is now uh, part of an office complex. Um, uh, also an early Kurt type card. That's something of note. So um, another another um, restaurant, the same formula of um, music and perhaps dancing uh, with uh, Chinese murals on the wall, some plants to give it some more decor. Uh, this was the Canton Cafe, uh, 527 South Main Street in Los Angeles. Um, also, there's a, a display case selling cigars. Um, that's sort of of interest on the on the bottom left hand side. Uh, this is also um, a restaurant about 1912-1913 in, in uh, Los Angeles, the Shanghai Cafe. And it's, what's interesting is that I believe there's menus on each table. You can see um, uh, some white sheets of paper, which I I I really think uh, must be must be menus. Uh, this is in New York City. Um, this is what a, a smaller Chinese restaurant uh, looked like um, compared to, you know, a place like the Port Arthur. This was uh, farther uptown. Um, the same uh, similar tables, uh, this time rectangular and um, also uh, some um, ornate wooden work and, and some murals uh, with a Chinese theme on the walls. So by about 1914, um, this expansion of Chinese restaurants um, really had become quite upscale. Uh, this is a um, 
a restaurant in the Times Square area called the Bunjan. Um, the the characters um, under the word Bunjan on the top uh, right hand corner mean uh, authentic. Uh, the character at the bottom in the in the, um, the bottom right hand corner, I think that's just something made up as to fill space. I asked Chinese friends of mine, and, and they said that's not a character. Um, and we can also see in this slide um, some people in the distance near the stairway. So per perhaps those are the waiters and, and uh, you know, some of the, the restaurant owners or, or, or managers, uh, quite an upscale place. Oh, this is one of my favorite cards, um, a marvelous picture of the same restaurant at night with uh, people dancing. I actually uh, did a Google search on this restaurant and found uh, some uh, testimony in a, in a court case involving the New York City police force where an officer was um, asked to, to go and shut down the restaurant and that was apparently at, at, at night, tell them to close late at night. And that was apparently against the regulations. So um, lots of interesting stories that are are lost, but um, and a few preserved, but, but um, this is really a, a wonderful special card. So um, the lunch trade was, of course, very important, um, and it was uh, chop suey was prominent. So you could uh, have a, a a meal here for thirty five cents, a full meal. Uh, and I'm I understand from a historian of, of restaurants in New York City that that was quite affordable. Again, we can see the um, the same pattern. Um, of ornate tables, ornate circular tables. Um, you can see menus on each table, um, mural work, um, seem to be some mirrors as well. And probably the manager and maybe the head waiter are in the picture. Um, this is the Charles B. Low first class Chinese restaurant. Um, the Hong Kong Low restaurant claimed to be the largest and finest Chinese restaurant in New York City. And this was, uh, uh, on Park Row, opposite the park, opposite the post office, really in the heart of the uh, enormously busy um, office office district of New York City, uh, really the greatest concentration of skyscrapers in the world. Then, so you know, seating capacity of 500, um, you can be sure that this would have been full at lunchtime, and um, probably had a you know good after dinner crowd as well, or or you know people going home. Um, after work might stop, you know, because the Brooklyn Bridge Terminal was was nearby, and the same patterns of ornate tables and also the um, the lacquer work and and murals. On um, this card, I'm happy to say I picked up at the Wichita Postcard Club. This is um, the Canton Tea Garden, which uh, specialized in chop suey, and in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so here we see palms uh, as uh, part of the part of the decoration, um, a little more mainstream um, than some of the cards that we've we've see, seen already. And this is the only early Canadian card that I was able to find. This is the Kingston's most beautiful cafe, the Mandarin King Street, and that's in Kingston, Ontario. And we see. Um, a lot of murals on the wall, some um, lantern style lighting, uh, but it's becoming more westernized uh, with it, particularly with the tablecloths and uh, the kind of semi booth like seating as well. So something happens, which actually is a good thing for a Chinese restaurant, uh, prohibition happens. And, and the result is that a lot of what uh, people called lobster palaces, which had cabaret entertainment and and um, on, on, in the Broadway Times Square area, they were aggressively shut down uh, as part of um, uh, prohibition. Um, they tried to stay open, but, but they just couldn't. Um, and the result is that some of these quite large spaces became Chinese restaurants because the, the Chinese restaurant owners you know, could, um, could afford the rents, their, their food costs were low, their labor costs were low. Um, so we'll see a number of number of examples of where they took over these these large um, uh, cabaret restaurant um, spaces. 
So here's one of those places. Um, the card on the left is Churchill's restaurant at Broadway and 49th Street. And um, this was one of those lobster palaces. So it's really the size of a basketball court inside. Um, whereas on the, uh, the card on the right-hand side is, is the business, the restaurant, Chinese restaurant called Yong's, which, which um, succeeded Churchill's in the same space. And you can see those same interior pillars, but they've tried to make it into a much smaller space, but it, it, it's, really a, it's really quite a large space. So Chinese restaurants have come a long way from um, small family restaurants in places like San Francisco. Um, you know, in the 19, 1920s, prohibition really, um, really does, uh, I think, speed along that process of cultural homogenization. So here's again, a couple more examples of um, Chinese restaurants taking over that uh, cabaret space that um, the, the, that, um, that became empty because of prohibition. This is the Palais d'Or, formerly the Palais Royale. Um, again, a, a large space. Uh, which, it was on the, the second floor of a, a, of a um, Broadway building. And on the right is uh, Chin Li, um, you know, that's Broadway at 44th Street, whereas the card on the left is Broadway at 48th Street. And here's uh, a couple more examples of that um, same um, large hall format. Um, on the left is the Mandarin Cafe at 400 Grant Avenue in San Francisco, uh, not too far from the uh, Shanghai Cafe we saw at the start. On the right is the uh, Cafe Restaurant uh, to, uh, tw at, on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. It had uh, music dancing. It was also radio broadcast from there. Um, second, uh, it occupied the second and third floors. I think it closed in the 1970s. A uh, couple more examples. One of my favorites on the left is the China Garden Restaurant in Hackensack, New Jersey. Um, and also had a, an orchestra. Uh, on the right is the uh, Nanking Cafe, Nan, Nankin Cafe in Minneapolis. I believe that restaurant first opened in uh, 1909. So quite a large space that they're that they're that they're occupying, and, and it's significant. They call it the Ameri finest American Chinese restaurant. Eventually, that university becomes Chinese American. Uh, so uh, this is the nightclub version of um, of the, of what succeeded the uh, cabaret restaurants, the Chinese nightclub version uh, with dancers and um, the in on the left hand card, um, I think the the black entertainers is inset is significant on the top right hand corner. you know it showed that um, these were not segregated places. Um, so on the right-hand side is, is a, uh, another example of um, a, a Kurtaik postcard. Both are Kurtaik postcards, by the way, for the Lotus restaurant. Uh, quite lovely cards. So here the, we start seeing the, the chop suey signage fade away. Um, more prominence is given to um, saying that it's American Chinese food or Chinese American food. Um, a couple again, a couple nice Kurt type cards. Uh, this also shows you know how Chinese restaurants expanded to the smaller cities across the United States as well. You, you really only need a couple people to start a Chinese restaurant. You know, you need a, a, a manager and a cook. Uh, and we can also see through the Chinese restaurants, uh, partly thanks to the excellent numbering system that the Kurt type company had. So the card on the left is from 19. 35, the card on the right is from 1941. So it's the same scene, but there's a process of modernization going, going on that the, um, the floor changes in the second card. Um, the ornate woodwork is gone. Um, we start seeing booth type seating. Um, so um, the old ways gradually, gradually fade away, but the the American love for Chinese food certainly doesn't fade away.
So we can also see um, booth type seating in um, these two restaurants, these two Chinese restaurants in Atlantic City. And um, Chinese restaurants uh, notably followed tourists. Um, so there was, that's one reason why there's a lot of um, Chinese restaurant cards of Florida as well. A couple of nice linen cards. And so here's the evolution of the boost um, type seating that uh, I think um, almost all of us must be familiar with. Um, the card on the right is of um, the Kong Chao restaurant in, in Rutland, Vermont. The card on the uh, card on the right is of the Pink Lantern restaurant in Medicine Hat, Alberta. And it also had, it's not easy for you to see them, but it, it had juke, jukebox features as well. Uh, this is the type of, re the, the card on the right is the type of restaurant that I went uh, with my parents to once a week in the small Ontario town that um, I lived in near Toronto during um, quite a bit of my childhood uh, called the Lido restaurant. So um, after sec Second World War, Chinese restaurants adapted to the growth of suburbs, more disposable in income and increased automobile use. Sometimes giant signs for them dominated the surrounding landscape. The Far East Imperial Restaurant was in um, Pompano Beach, Florida, and the Golden Buddha Restaurant was in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, you couldn't miss these if you're driving down the street, that's for sure. Um, next slide. Uh, a couple more examples of giant signs. Um, on the left, we have the Chiam restaurant, short for Chinese American uh, restaurant in Chicago. And on the right, we have restaurant um, Shea Wong in um, Montreal, Quebec, which advertised uh, Chinese Canadian food and cocktails as well. A uh, couple more examples. On the left is the Taishan restaurant in San Antonio. Again, a big sign. You could also get steaks there. Can't see it quite well, but, and chicken, I believe. And uh, on the right is uh, the Jade restaurant in Kingman, Arizona, which was a local institution. Um, can't miss those signs, that's for sure. Uh, some more examples of signs on opposite coasts. Um, Gang Su's Tea Garden in Porterville, California. Nice linen card. And on the right, another linen card, the Chinaland Restaurant in Beverly, Massachusetts. Um, can't miss that sign. A uh, couple Canadian examples here. On the left is the uh, Bamboo Inn in Cornwall, Ontario. On the right is Wong's Kitchen in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. Uh, this time it's New Brunswick's turn. Uh, on the left is Ming's Garden in Moncton and uh, Ming's uh, near Fredericton, New Brunswick. Sometimes the, the architecture of these restaurants could be a little kitschy, if I'm, if I can, if I'm allowed to say that comment, especially the, the, car, the restaurant on the left. Um, uh, and of course the Chinatowns didn't go away. Um, the card on the left is from New York City. The card on the right is from Boston. Um, so um, the, these bright neon displays really, really were something. Uh, sometimes the China restaurant restaurants would also have a, a, a branch somewhere else in, in New York City or, or Boston, perhaps. Uh, here's the rice bowl from the Chinatown restaurant. It's a, these are post-World War II scenes. Uh, the card on the right was actually a, a poster in the restaurant as well. Uh, some friendly ladies, I, which I could had been able to make their acquaintance. Um, we also see a cocktail bar in the card on the left. Um, another um, sign of the cultural homogenization I've been talking about. Uh, as and and uh, the same kind of booth type seating. Um, and this is uh, Bob Lee's Lantern House uh, in in Boston. Uh, Bob seems to have had his own cookbook for sale. Uh, you can see that on the left-hand card, the, the bottom panel. Um, so uh, quite nice, uh, quite nice decor. You know, real feeling of uh, of Chineseness. Um, it opened. It 
it opened 1951, then it was and it closed in 1961. It was uh, remodeled into a tiki bar, which um, means it has had a Polynesian theme. Uh, this is Vancouver, uh, a shot of um, the Ming's restaurant and also the bamboo terrace at, on the on the left, and then on the right is a a, a card is um, devoted only to Ming's. Um, they had wedding banquets there. It was um, um, important place for the, the Chinese community. Love those cars in the front too. Um, so um, after the Second World War, um, in Toronto, for example, there were five or six large Chinese restaurants. Um, Lychee Garden is uh, well known among them. Uh, Lychee Garden is on the right. Um, so there's less, so the by then the, the Chinese decor uh, really is uh, mostly on the walls. Um, the right is the Republic Restaurant in the Times Square area. Um, Republic Restaurant had been around since at least the, the 1920s and second floor Broadway location, probably lasted in the 19, 1970s. Um, like family, like most, these Chinese restaurants were basically family businesses and eventually they, uh, they closed up, people retired, or th there wasn't anyone to take them over, uh, or you know, buildings were demolished. Or um, so we can see more 1960s decor in uh, a couple Canadian Chinese restaurants. On the left is um, the Diners Rendezvous in Nanaimo, British Columbia. Uh, that was one of the um, early settlement places in Canada for the Chinese. Um, and on the right is the Shanghai Chop Suey restaurant. Um, that particular restaurant in Winnipeg lasted until 2011. It was in the same family for 70 years. It was a real uh, Winnipeg institution. Um, so we have, to, we have to particularly mention or a tip of the hat to the Jewish community. Um, in, some, in this one of those odd twists of history, um, Chinese food qualifies as kosher food under Jewish dietary laws because it's not prepared with milk. So um, there's there's a real um, camaraderie or, or a special bond uh, between uh, Jewish people and, and Chinese restaurants, and, and that's okay. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think why there's a heck of a lot of, of Chinese restaurants in uh, New York City. So here's a couple examples of um, the the one on the left was actually in in Chinatown and the one on the right uh, was in the midtown area of, of Manhattan a quite prominent uh, cocktail bar in in, in both of them uh, a couple more um, cards of Chinese restaurants in um, New York City the card on the left is from the 1950s the card on the right is a, a chrome card again, from the 1960s, both have uh, uh, prominent cocktail lounges. Um, and uh, the, the decoration become a little, becomes a little kitschy, but you know, it's, it's, um, it met a real need. So this slide is actually the last slide in the presentation because it marks a turning point um, in the, the mid 1960s as part of, um, I would say general liberalization in society that the immigration laws are relaxed. And uh, before then, you know, from the 1880s in, in the United States and also a bit later on in Canada, there's, there's, there are real restrictions on Chinese immigration to, to Canada and the United States. It's very difficult. So we actually, to some degree, we have bachelor societies that, that live in the China, that grow up in the China, exist in the Chinatowns. But um, this particular card, this woman, uh, I think because of that relaxation of the immigration laws with the biases against Asians, was able to hire eight chefs from Taiwan and they could cook marvelous Sichuan dishes. And that was discovered by the, the New York Times. And um, so today in, in many cities, you know, you can find very authentic Chinese food. Um, there's a restaurant I go to in North Toronto where I feel like I'm back in China where I lived for, for a while. Um, 
particularly in uh, in New in the New York City area, there's some a couple of Chinatowns which have um, been established distant, uh, but not too distant from the original Chinatown in New York City, and and there's all kinds of different Chinese restaurants uh, showcasing the uh, different regional cuisines of of China, whether it's it's the Northeast or the Southeast or or the West or um, you know, middle China. Um, so th this is, uh, this card illustrates uh, a turning point in, in that story of, of cultural imagination, that diversity and, and more authenticity in Chinese food um, is, is on the menu. It, it, that's, that, that's the start of the trend to what start of the uh, reestablishment of authentic Chinese food in um, Canada and, and the United States. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you, Kyle. Um, let's see. Um, Bob, Bill, do you want to uh, help us with some of the questions? Um. <clears throat> Regarding the Port Arthur uh, restaurant uh, kitchen, are those ducks in the lower right? Um, I expect so, you know, because Peking duck is um, a Chinese specialty. Um, I expect those are ducks. Okay, but, but not, not sure. Okay. Uh, I'd have to look, I'd have to look at the card again. I'd have to look more closely. Okay. Um, the, uh, in general, the, 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 the person who posted this says the, the kitchen uh, images are absolutely fabulous. Yeah, that, 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 that's a wonderful card. It, it, it is genuinely rare. It, it's a genuinely rare card. Um, I can't think of hardly any kitchen restaurant kitchen being on a postcard that I've seen before, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a few of German restaurants in, in New York City, but but it, it's scarce. Yeah. Because um, they, the kitchen postcards speak to the hierarchy of the kitchen. Um, and maybe managers didn't want to see that, but but when you, when you do see the, the interiors, um, they, they, they really are special because, you know, they profile the cleanliness, but, you know, they also profile that hierarchy between the managers and the, and the waiters and, and the cooks, especially the, um, the head waiters. Um, that, that's a whole different collecting topic in, in itself. An article maybe for postcard history. That's true. That's we'll take true. you up on it. Okay, Bill. <laughs> okay, we're a little short on, on questions at this point. Um, so anybody who's got something that they want to uh, ask, please type it into the uh, chat window. Carol, go ahead. Yes, now, yes. In your presentation, it was one of the first, between, I would say, the second or seventh presentation, you had a um, picture of a restaurant. It was a large entrance. And then in the back, you could see there was a door or entrance to the restaurant. But the entrance it looked like as you looked on the left a stand-up piano i don't remember and, and oh, I that's, was in, that's in that's in los angeles the canton cafe okay wow and then 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 you later on you mentioned music in the restaurants that's very interesting yeah it it, it was a, a natural a natural fit i think um you know that people wanted to to go out and, ha and have a meal and also do a little bit of dancing as well and and um the chinese restaurant owners were happy to oblige sometimes um there was an orchestra sometimes i guess there was just a piano like in like in that small um small restaurant you know so they they promised um good food and, and a good enjoyable eating experience um and without discriminating against any any groups um, black or white. Another question has come in. Uh, Kyle, was there any tradition 
of anything like restaurants in China itself? Or was the idea of a restaurant something that uh, new to the proprietors in North American restaurants in the early 20th century? Well, there there are there are Chinese restaurants in in um, in in China, but uh, sometimes they're 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 more outdoor restaurants. Um, there there's not a there's not a lot of um, stuff. There's not a lot of postcards on that on that theme. Um, I I can't uh, I can't speak to that in any detail. Very Another much. question has come in. Are there, are any of these restaurants still functioning uh, in some form? I I don't I don't believe so. There's one um, in Digby, Nova Scotia that that's not in the presentation, but in my collection, I think it's still open. And another one in New York City um, that's open. But generally, you know, they they were family businesses. So eventually, as people retired, they closed or. Um, you know, areas were redeveloped. Sometimes Chinatowns were were pushed out into other areas of the city, and and um, that might lead to a restaurant closure, or the restaurant might actually uh, move. But uh, but generally, um, the, these are labor intensive places, and they they require a lot of um, a lot of hands, helping hands of of family members to keep them going. Um, particularly, I think. In light of um, the immigration restrictions that were in were in effect for for a long time. All right, another question: Chinatown in various large cities <coughs> are among the few places <coughs> me, where tourists uh, uh, and postcard collectors can reliably find modern Chrome postcards uh, to purchase, send, and collect in the twenty first century. True or false? Uh, that is true, actually. Um, there's a number of um, postcards of, of Chinatown. You can also find some on Etsy as well. Some newer, newer, some of those newer cards of Chinatown scenes. I've seen them for Toronto, so I'm sure there must be some ver Etsy versions for for New York City as well. Um, Chinese restaurants generally today aren't issuing uh, postcards. I, I've seen very very little of that. Um, so the, the Chinese, the China, the scenes of Chinatowns today are are more street scenes. Okay, well that's all I've got. Thanks. This has been terrifically interesting, Carl. Uh, thanks very much, Bill. <laughs>